Wow, thanks, Helen James. Um, 150 days, according to that website that popped up on the QR code, 150 days till focus. Um, I, um, I love focus. Kate and I have missed, I think, one in like 20 years. Um, and it's just an incredible, like James said, it's just a place where uh, you get disturbed. You get out of your kind of regular routine. And I, the first time I went, I met with a, a way that absolutely transformed my life, met with the Holy Spirit in a way that just completely changed the direction of everything. And um, it's an amazing, amazing time. Uh, do chat to people at the back and find out more if you're interested. Um, I want to speak a bit this morning. I just had on my heart to speak a little bit about um, this season of Lent. If you don't know, we're in the season of Lent, started on Wednesday, the 40 days that go up to Easter. And Christians around the world kind of mark this season. And it's a bit of a strange one. There's lots of strange uh, kind of signs and symbols that go along with it. You might have seen Ash Wednesday was last Wednesday. The day that, I mean, to be fair, the day before is Pancake Day, which is just like the best. Uh, but then it's uh, Ash Wednesday and you see people with like an ash cross put on their forehead. And really, Lent, I think it's a bit like what we were talking about with focus. It's a chance to let ourselves be disturbed, let ourselves be shaken up a bit out of the usual rhythms and routines that we get into to ask God, have you got more? Is there more? Is there more for me? Uh, is there more in this relationship that you're calling me into? Is there more for this life that you've promised me? Um, I think James shared why, uh, Elizabeth Stinson a while back said um, that people are done with trivial love. People are done with trivial love. And I think Lent is a season where we can just go, Lord, Lord, where have I trivialized stuff? Where have I not realised the expansiveness yet of your love? Where do you have more for me? And um, as I was looking at, um, uh, well, actually, I was reading a book um, that I came across by a, a Korean kind of sociological person called Boyung Chul Han. Uh, it's called The Burnout Society. And actually, I slightly hesitate to recommend it because I haven't finished it. So if you do look at that book, and at the end, he's like, I hate cats. I'm really sorry, I haven't got to the end, so can't recommend it yet. Um, but he was kind of asking the question, why is it that, that kind of the biggest challenges our culture faces, specifically in the West, are not so much out there, but in here? The internal anxiety, depression, kind of all, all, all of the associated issues that come with it. And one of the ways that he answers this, that he points to, is he says there's an excessivity, uh, there's an excess of violent positivity, is his uh, analysis. He says that everything in our culture says yes to us. Yes, yes, you can do it. Yes, you can be it. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, he says, what it turns out is, that's not good for us. That actually, you need no you need no's in your life to be able to live well. And you, you might be convinced, you might not be. But he says we're surrounded by yes, yes to self, yes to desire, yes to ambition. And the result is not good for us because we're constantly encouraged to maximise ourself, to take every aspect of our life and make it really efficient and squeeze the most out of it. And he says it just doesn't really work. Like one of the ways that um, our culture does this, the smartphone, amazing blessing, but it tricks us into thinking that we can have everything, we can be everywhere, we can do everything. Like I think back, like I'm definitely going to use this against my kids when they complain in the future. I remember before Wi-Fi, I remember, I did university without internet, like I did a music degree, I had to listen to music, I'd have to go to an actual library, find an actual CD, put it in a CD player and sit there and listen to it. Like now Spotify just does it. I can pluck anything from anywhere, just straight to my phone, listen to a bit, I'm done. I would have, I'd have, I'd have done, I'm, I wouldn't have done better in my degree. But, um, but it speeds, it, there's so much available to us and it can trick us into thinking that you can be anything, you can do anything and you can become anything. And what he points out is while that sounds really empowering, actually, and this is what people have understood for years, but haven't often voiced is that that's a lot of burdens to carry. Actually, the burden that, that places on you is that you, you need to work out who you are. This is all on you. 
And if it's to be your authentic self, you're true to yourself, no one can help you. You are abandoned in this. There's no one outside for the secular. Like, there's no God out there who's going to talk to you. Your family, they can't tell you. Your society can't. Your, your body doesn't even tell you anything about it. Like, you know, just maximise your sleep. Like, just keep going. Um, don't listen to anything. And the result is exhaustion. Well, actually, the result, the result he says, is it, is it creates this pressure to perform. And the problem with performing is that it's never satisfied. You, you can rest from work, but you can never rest from the need to perform. And actually, it invades absolutely everything. It invades our exercise, our creativity, our nutrition, even sleep. Like I read this article the other day about people who've been using sleep tracking apps to, you know, optimize their sleep and to get their sleep really well. And it's actually created a performance anxiety on sleep because you wake up in the morning and your app says, no, you didn't perform that well. Your sleep wasn't good enough. Try harder tomorrow. And whereas the work ends, the pressure to perform never does. And actually, because everything is possible, because everything is yes, 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 and the sole arbiter is me, the only no can come from me as well. And again, that's yet another burden that you're abandoned to work out for us. And the problem with that is, I don't know about you, but my desires are, are disordered. My wants are often wanting. I want more than I have time for, so I feel torn. I, I want what I want is not always good for me, so I'm often injured. My wants are in conflict with each other within myself, so I'm unsatisfied. And my wants are often in conflict with other people's wants, and so I'm in co competition. And that leads to exhaustion. And actually, the people who do well in our culture, he points out and says, are the ones who've found a way to say no. And a really vivid example for this, not in the kind of the spiritual realm, but in technology is that... I don't know if you saw this, Johnny Ives is a British guy, invented the iPhone under Apple, and uh, he uh, was interviewed a while ago, and he said that when he was working for Steve Jobs, who was leading Apple, Steve Jobs knew that Johnny Ives wasn't very good at focusing, and he needed focus. In other words, he needed to say no to some things. And so we'd always ask him, what are you saying no to? And he said he would basically clocked onto this. We had a list of things that he was saying no to, but that he didn't really care about. And, uh, and he said, Steve Jobs just saw right through it. So he said, no, like you can only say the no only counts if it's a sacrifice. It, it only counts if with every bone in your body, you want to say yes to it. You wake up thinking about it. It would be a really good idea. But because you're focused on something else, you've said no, that's the no that counts. And so this guy was mentored to say no, 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 all the way to creating the most influential object and piece of technology that's transformed the way that we live, uh, which then ironically thinks we, makes us think we can now say yes to everything. So there is a deep irony there as well. But in this place, we need no. We need the way, ability to say no. To Actually, most importantly, we need the ability to hear God's no in our life. Now, the challenge with that is we often think he's saying no to us. But actually, with everything God says, he says yes to you. He says so much yes to you. He sent his one and only son to die on a cross for you so that you could receive. We're told all the promises of God are yes in Jesus. He says yes to you. But he often doesn't say no. He says a no to the way that we think will bring about that life in all its fullness. The ways that we live. The ways that we think we can carry our life. And into that, Jesus speaks a different word. He, he looks, this, we're going to look at Matthew 11. And this is a, a, a passage that's full of confusion. It's full of people being disappointed with Jesus. It's full of Jesus' team still not getting it as they never seem to do. And into all of that confusion, into all of that exhaustion, Jesus says this to us, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now in Jesus' words here, there are a lot of no's. He says no to quite a few things. First of all, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. And this is the no to going it alone. Jesus doesn't want you to go through this life alone, on your own. He says, come to me. Come on, come, come to me. Come to me, come and be with me. Now it's really interesting. Jesus is really humble, but he's not at all modest. Like he's really humble. He, he, doubt, he doesn't show everything that he is, but he's not at all modest when it comes to like, he says it's all about him. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, come, come to someone else. He says, come to me. And notice, he doesn't say, come to my seminar or come to my online webinar. He says, come to me. Come and live a relationship with me because the end goal is a friendship with him. See, see, often we try and live the life of Jesus without the lifestyle of Jesus. We try and do the works of Jesus without the way of Jesus. And that doesn't work. You can't separate the two. Um, I had a friend called Tim. And uh, Tim felt that he uh, hadn't optimised his body enough and needed a killer six-pack. And uh, this was the days, the first days of YouTube. And he came across this video. Uh, David's going to play for us. Uh, this is Eight Minute Abs. Welcome to your eight minute abs workout. Now, music all the exercises are safe, effective, and fun. There's gonna be nine movements with 45 seconds built into it. All right, let's get going. The first exercise is gonna be the basic crunch. Hands behind the head and just crunch right up. My feet are on the ground. Remember the old time sit ups you had to go all the way to the top? Not this time, gang. We're gonna save the back. Dave, all you, you want to do is curl up. Notice play. this my lower back so, is on the ground. My hands my, placed uh, behind the ears. Here. And I'm slowly just looking abs. up towards the ceiling and And he only had eight up. minutes a day. Unfortunately, he found eight minute abs. And he did this video every day for a year. Every day for a year. And by the end of it, he had the most amazing abs I have ever seen. They were washboard abs. You could have grated cheese on them. It was like they were defined beyond belief. The only problem was that is all my friend Tim did. He didn't do anything else. And eventually his, his front muscles got so strong, it pulled him over into a curve because he wasn't doing anything for his back. And uh, he, he took him a while to cotton on what was happening. And then when he realised he had to go and see a, a, a chiropractor and basically took him about three years of Pilates to undo and balance himself out. You cannot separate the works of Jesus from the ways of Jesus. You can't just take one little bit and be like, oh, I'm just going to take this bit and try and do it in my own strength. The Jesus way is wedded to the truth of Jesus. But often the truth of Jesus is a bit of easier because you can go, well, I know that, but I'll hold it over here. Or I know that and I'll poke other people with it. But Jesus has come to me. The works of Jesus are wedded to the way of Jesus. We can't separate the two. He says no to going it alone. Come to me. So what's the qualification? Is it you have to get the eight minute abs if you have to sort yourself out? What's the qualification to come to Jesus? It's all you who are weary and burdened. This is the no to hiding. Do you know what? It's when you act are at your last and your least and your most lost, that's when you can know that you are most qualified to come to Him. It's not all who have sorted yourselves out and kind of know where you're going. It's not all who are doing really well and didn't shout at anyone on the way to church this morning, even though we couldn't drive here because of the marathon. It's not all who think they've got it all glowing and sorted. It's all who are weary you know, those of us who are actively trying to sort our lives out and it just doesn't seem to work, all who are heavy laden, those who things from outside of our control are weighing you down today, that's when you are qualified to come to Him. There's a Peanuts cartoon where Charlie says, 
sometimes I feel my soul is full of weeds. And I just love those words. And it's that moment, it's that moment when you are the worst you ever feel. That's when you can know He came for you and He loved you and He died for you. And it's then you can be sure that He says, come to me. Come to me. This is the no to hiding. I, you know, there's so much stuff that we carry that weighs us down. I, um, I did what the adverts around Brighton have been saying uh, this last week. They, they've been advertising the buses to say, two pound, you can go anywhere. And I took uh, our three kids on the bus. That's basically the only thing they've been asking to do since we moved to Brighton. Can we go on a bus? Can we go on the top deck? So we went down to Rottingdean. We went, had a lovely time on the beach. And then we're walking back up to the bus. And Clara was like, ah, oh, so tired and I was like literally you've walked down the road we've gotten a bus the whole way we've had fun on the beach and she was just like ah oh, duh and c- complaining all the way and I had no I, I'd run out of patience I was like just keep moving on it wasn't until I got her home and I took a coat off and I was like this thing weighs a ton and I was like I looked in it and it was she'd filled every pocket with a rock and I was like oh my goodness I forced you to walk uphill from the bus with all these rocks I was like why did you do this and she was like well, these are the rocks that I love. And that's such a picture of me. We have all these things that we burden ourselves up with and we carry and we make ourselves wearisome. And Jesus says, in that moment, come to me, come to me. And what will he do? I will give you rest. What does this rest look like? Gap year, travel around Asia, spa day, all of those things are good. But actually he says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is the no to living an unattached life. The no to never committing to anything, to to never investing your life into something. And it's a brilliant picture. You know, not many of us here are probably farmers, but a yoke is such an amazing image of what Jesus wants to do for our lives because a yoke is, is for farming. A yoke is for farming. It's not an egg yoke. It's a, it's a yoke of a, not, no, it's, a, it's an egg yoke. It's an instrument for farming. And we've got a little video that David's going to play. And I, I'll, I'll explain it for all of us who, like me, are not farmers. This is um, of two oxen pulling a, uh, pulling a plow. And so the way it works is you get these two oxen and the yoke is the bar that goes between the two. And then it pulls a plough and it takes the life and the strength and the energy of this oxen and it forces it into the ground to prepare it to receive the crop that's going to be put into it. And sometimes, you know, the ground looked really nice in the last one, but maybe the ground of our lives is a lot more like this. But again, it takes the energy of us and it forces it into something. And Jesus says, this is what he wants you to do. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And it's interesting because when Jesus offers a yoke, you might think the last thing somebody who's tired and burned out and worn out needs is work. You think they need mattress or a vacation, not a yoke. But actually, Jesus realises that the most restful gift he can give give the tired is not a way of escaping, but a new way of carrying our lives. Actually, there's great dignity. At the the Spear celebration, somebody said this last time, when I got a job, it was such a weight off my shoulders because I'd lost my work, my work ethic and my rhythm of life. And Jesus says, actually, take my yoke. This is a new and better way to carry the responsibilities of your life, a fresh way to walk through life. Realism kind of says, actually, life does involve a succession of burdens. We can't get away from them. We can't escape them. But Jesus offers us a new equipment to carry them. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is the no to working it out yourself. This is the no to going, actually, I'll just see if I can work it out and make sense of it myself. Jesus says, learn from me. See, what they'd done in those days is they took this picture of the yoke and it was used as a metaphor for the way you lived your life. 
So when you went to follow a teacher, it was said that the way they taught you to live your life, that was the yoke that you were going to submit yourselves to and limit your life to in the same way that those two oxen are limited now to go together. Jesus says, I'm going to offer you a way of living that's going to bring rest to your very souls. This is the no to working it out for yourself. How, what is his teaching? Well, we're going to look at this over the next two weeks as we think about the vision of St. Peter's. But Jesus summarises all of it as to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. Or the summary that I love, love God with passion and love people on purpose. Love God with passion and love people on purpose. And what that means is your greatest need in life is to find a way to give your attention to Jesus and to worship Him with passion. Actually, as you worship Him with your attention, with your time, with with your treasure, as you worship Him, you will find rest for your souls. But it also means that after loving God with passion, your greatest need in life is to find a way to love people on purpose, to love your neighbour as yourself. And that starts with just feet washing. It just starts with serving your neighbour. But there becomes a special place where you find the unique talents and gifts that God has given you and you find a way to harness those, channel those into the life of others that brings about a joy that you've never known. And we're going to be thinking about that the next two weeks. This is the no to being unattached, the no to working it out for yourself. And the joy is, he says this, learn from me, learn from me. This is the no to self-importance, the no to pride, the no to I am the way I am and I will never change. Now, often when I think people think about following Jesus, they can think about, oh, you have to get it right first time. It's binary. It's like you're following him, you're not following him, and now you're following him perfectly. I I mentioned before, I I studied at music college, and there was... um, there's a famous piece of music by a musician called Frank Zappa. He kind, of, he kind of stretches all genres. And one of the pieces he wrote was called The Black Page. We've got a picture of it here. And the reason it's called The Black Page is it's so complicated. Like the page, uh, and when you see all the parts together, it's more notes than it is blank space. And it's the most ridiculous, complicated piece of sort of cross rhythms and, uh, and subdivisions and changing time signatures. And the whole the whole band are playing in unison. So if you get a note wrong, everybody knows. Everybody knows. And you stand out like a sore thumb. And Frank Zappa used to use this as an audition piece because he'd say, turn up, play this. If you can do it, you're in. If you can't, see you later. I hear, you know, I hear lesser bands are looking for a a guitarist. And there's this story of this young 18-year-old who found a recording of this piece and he transcribed it and he got it note perfect. And so Frank Zappa said, well, you can be in the band. And I think sometimes we think that's what following Jesus is like, that you've got to get it note perfect. You've got to get it. It's really hard and it's impossible to do. And he says, if you get it right, then you can be in on the club. But actually, that's not the way. He says, learn from me. In other ways, words, Jesus assumes that you will get this wrong. He assumes that you will find this hard. He assumes that you want to give up on the way. In fact, the Sermon on the Mount assumes that you will be filled with shame, filled with guilt, want to divorce your spouse, murder your neighbour, all all the kind of things. He assumes that those things will pass through your heart. And yet he still says, come to me. I love it in the message translation. It says, come to me and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And he says, you will find rest for your souls. And this is our last one. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the no to unrealistic expectations. I don't know about you, but if you start to look at things on productivity tools on social media, that's it. 
the algorithm is just feeding you stuff. Like every calendar app that comes out, every way to like maximise your time. I saw the most ridiculous thing the other day. So this guy talking about how he has is, he is stacked his time because he does this. Every morning, his day begins at 6am and his first day is 6am till 12 noon. He was like, that's day one. And then day two begins at noon till 6pm. And then that's day two. And then day three is 6pm till midnight. And I was like, oh, you, you mean you work six hours over three days? He was like, no, I have three days in one day. And then you stack that over and you have manipulated time. And now you have like 27 days and just fight. And it was like, no, you haven't. No, no, you, that doesn't work. You cannot do that. You might think you could do that, but you can't do it. There's so much out there that wants to put a burden on us to say you can maximise every detail of your life and you're going to find the life that is eluding you. And it's not true. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. There is so much out there and within us that wants to put burdens on us that we cannot carry. Um, I saw this a while ago. A farmer in a, the Indian state of uh, Kanatka was, he was troubled with monkeys kind of always stealing his crops. And he came up with an ingenious way to get rid of them. He got his dog and he painted it to look like a tiger. This is Tiger Dog up here. <laughs> And, uh, and it worked. The monkeys no longer came to steal the crops because they would come and they would see the tiger and they would run away. But that's a quite a big burden to put on a dog when a tiger turns up and, uh, and thinks it wants to, oh, looks like a nice mate. Um, Jesus doesn't put any burdens on us that are impossible. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why does he do that? Well, because he's gentle and lowly. This is the only place in the Bible where we're told what Jesus is like in his heart. Like the, when the curtain is drawn back and you see Jesus for who he is, this is what he says. He says, I need you to know, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And by heart, he means this is the way that he wakes up. This is the thing he dreams about when he's asleep. This is the driving force in Jesus' life is that he is gentle. He could have said, you know, it doesn't say he is, is austere and demanding. It doesn't say he's exalted and dignified. It doesn't even say that he's generous and joyful because actually that would mean that you kind of need to be joyful if you're going to come to him and you might not be feeling that way. He says he's gentle. He's not trigger happy. He knows what you need. He can meet your needs. He is gentle. It, it, the most natural posture to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. And he is humble. He's lowly. This is the most repeated word it, 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 to describe the life that Jesus leads in, us into. Do you know what? No one has ever been more accessible and approachable than Jesus. He says, come to me. Come to me. He is gentle and there's nothing that can stop you. There is more mercy in his heart than there is disobedience in yours. There's more grace in him than there is sin in me. And he says, come to me, come to me. This is the no to unrealistic and impossible expectations. And what happens is, as we start to lean into that and to receive that, not getting it straight away, because you'll have to learn it, but actually this starts to transform us. And we start to become people who say it back to him. Do you know what? There's only one time in the whole of the Bible that we hear the Holy Spirit speak. There's only one time that you hear the Holy Spirit say something. And it's in the book of Revelation. And it's the Holy Spirit saying, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just say it by himself. It says the Spirit and the Bride say come. In other words, at the end of time, the Holy Spirit and the church will say to Jesus, come. And they won't just say it with their words, they'll say it with their life, they'll say it with their desires, they'll say it with every part of themselves. They will say, Jesus, we want you to come. Come and fill our lives, come and fill our families, come and fill our church, come and fill our city, our world. And every time that we join in with that prayer, because I don't know about you, I don't say it with all of my being yet, but we are promised that that's what the Holy Spirit is transforming us to become people who hear Jesus says, come to me, go on, come to me, come to me. And we become people who say it back to him. We say, Jesus, come to me, 
Come to me. Come to my family. Come to my church. Come to my city. We can't do this without you. Come to us, we pray. And the promise is that that's what the Holy Spirit is saying too. And that gives us the confidence to know that as we pray this, we can know that He's going to answer it. And it won't always look like what we think it should in this moment, at this time. But He is always doing what we need and He's doing it in a way that is far better than we could ever imagine. Amen. Why don't we stand? And let's pray that prayer. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill us afresh so that we might be people who can receive Jesus' invitation and extend it to others as well. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we hear of what you're doing around the world. We've heard of you doing amazing things at university campuses in America. We've heard you doing things in churches. On the Alpha Weekend Away, we've heard you encountering people. We want that for ourselves. Holy Spirit, come and fill us up now, we pray. We wait on you.